hi everyone. Thanks for making the last minute switch here um, over from Facebook. Hopefully this is working for, for everyone. It looks like we have um, 150 or so people on. So hi from Kansas City. Um, hope you're all doing well. Um, I think we'll just continue to let people in as we get going. So um, I, I see the number going up. So I'll, I'll kind of um, kill some time here um, until we have um, maybe most of the people um, that are going to be here here. So um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for uh, to Nathan for setting all this up. This is a really amazing community that we have here. And um, I think it's it's going to be uh, really, really powerful for all of us just moving through and navigating the, the coming weeks and the coming coming months. Um, and being able to bounce ideas off of each other, hopefully get some advice from one another. So thank you, Nathan, for thinking of this and for all the administrative work that you put into um, just organizing it and today getting everyone over to Zoom. Um, yeah. so really great to be on here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Um, really, it's, it's, it looks like it's gonna be a stacked lineup. I see people added to the, the schedule every day and um, I'm looking forward um, just to, to hearing what you all have to share um, in the in the coming weeks, I think it's going to be great. So, yeah. um, one question for you: So, since we're on um, Zoom, is there still um, a way to to share um, questions and comments and that sort of thing, or should we um, start a thread over on Facebook? Yeah. So, uh, in the there's a chat feature, and uh, Matt Evans has already asked: Is this being recorded and uploaded to Zoom? Yes, uh, it is. Um, it will be uh, recorded and uploaded, and I'll share that uh, link um, to the Facebook page. Um, also, you know, so there's a chat over here. So if you all have questions uh, throughout um, the, the presentation, you know, feel free to just um, type them in over there and then maybe we can address them at the end. Okay, that sounds good. And what I was gonna suggest also is if, maybe if we did have a, a thread or, I mean, I, I see you've already started a couple of threads on the Facebook page that have been really helpful um, that we can continue the conversation over there um, after this talk today. Um, so I'm, I'm finding um, just through all of this, I think we're all handling this all um, a, a little bit differently. Um, and even day to day, it's kind of up and down. Um, I'm finding for me, Today's a great day. I went outside and it was sunny and I went for a run and I feel great today. And other days I, I don't feel as good. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing, um, for me, some of the, the best days are, are the days that I'm teaching and I'm interacting with people. Um, and I get done um, teaching a bunch of lessons and having studio class and I just feel uplifted. So I think the big takeaway is we all just need to find as many ways to interact as possible. Uh, they're calling it social distancing, but it's really physical distancing, right? Um, so as much as we can uh, remain social, I think it's going to help all of our mental health. Um, so today I'm in, I'm, I was planning on talking about motivation and um, motivation generally, but also as it relates to the situation that we've all found ourselves in recently. Um, and then the second topic I wanted to cover is a little more practical on the horn. Um, I'll have my horn and demonstrate a little bit, but it's related to applying voicing exercises to developing tone and projection. Um, so the the topic of motivation, um, well, actually, um, when, when Nate texted me last week um, asking if I'd be interested in doing this, um, he said, what would you want to present on? And I said, well, the two things on my mind right now are motivation um, for myself and um, also like these voicing exercises I've been working on and I'll get into that later but um, I want to try to I don't want to make any assumptions about um, any of you um, participating today I, I, I see a, a number of different groups where it seems to me there are a lot of students who are doing quite well and are, are maintaining motivation really well I have students who've rescheduled their recitals and are planning to live stream them. And they've even switched up their programs so that they can do solo works and they can do works with fixed media or even um, they're finding ways of playing accompanied works um, like with smart music or with um, Patman CD uh, MIDI accompaniments. And there are other ways to do that. So I see some of those students just kind of pushing forward and, and being really successful with it. Um, I, I tend to see more of a challenge with 
uh, professionals who had a lot of performances lined up and now suddenly they're canceled or they're postponed. Um, in particular, if, if this is the way that you make your living. Um, and, and so there are a lot of people really hurting right now. So um, I wanna approach this talk today. Um, really, I wanted to focus on motivation generally because I, I found that it was helpful for my students before we were social distancing and um, quarantining and all that. But I also don't wanna minimize um, the, the uh, kind of the pain that, that a lot of people are going through at this point. Um, and, and so I'll try to, um, try to maintain um, uh, just an awareness um, that we're all going through things a little bit differently at this point. So um, I, I think um, as, a, as a starting point, um, if let's say you're at this point now where you're struggling to even find the motivation to play, like even pull the horn out. Um, I think one thing for you to keep in mind, um, and I'll be honest, I was there um, not that long ago where um, all these premieres lined up week after week after week for the next few months, and now they're all kind of stripped away. Um, and with the premieres, they'll get rescheduled. Um, but for now, I need to find a way to get back on the horn. And um, the thing that I'm finding is when I when I play, um, I find that it's it's very therapeutic. And I find that when I am finished playing, it feels really good. And it lifts my spirits the same way um, when I'm teaching and I um, interact with my students, it lifts my spirits. And today to see all of you on today, um, it, it lifts my spirits, it uh, brightens my outlook a bit. So um, the first thing I would say is you, you just kind of have to, you just have to take that first step and play and don't worry about what that's going to look like. I um, compare oftentimes in my studio, my, my students know I'm, I, um, I do triathlon uh, as, as a, it's a big hobby of mine. And so I spend a lot of time training for triathlon and it's a big part of my lifestyle. And so I make a lot of comparisons or analogies to that. And so one comparison for me right now is like um, swimming um, where I, I found, I find when I take time off from going to the pool to swim, the hardest thing is just to get to the pool and get changed and get in the water. So sometimes I just make a goal. Well, today I'm just going to get my feet into the water and anything beyond that is, is like icing on the cake. So um, you can start with sort of a really low bar of just assembling the instrument and soaking a reed and, and playing a bit. And you'll find once you get going, you'll, you won't want to stop. You'll, you'll keep going and, and time will pass and then you kind of get into a groove. So again, I don't want to make the assumption that any of you individually are at that point, but if that's where you're at, um, I know that's one thing that helped me was just to, to start playing again. Um, one of the things that I found challenging during this time is um, we have a lot of habits that are really strongly ingrained. Um, and the strongly ingrained habits that have continued um, where all of this hasn't affected those things, I'm finding I'm, I'm in a groove and I keep doing those things. I uh, just about every morning I wake up and I go for a run or I get on my bike trainer and ride indoors and those things are unaffected but the pools are closed. So I can't go to the pool, for example. And what I'm finding is there are alternatives to going to the pool. I can do exercises to mimic swimming, but I haven't started doing them yet because I, I'm just kind of overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. And um, it's, so it's sort of that, that same thing that it's hard to start a new habit and it takes sometimes weeks for those habits to stick. Um, and so I think we all have to kind of adjust. We had a plan probably set through March through April, through May, through June, whatever it might be. And now we have to change that plan and start fresh. And, and that can be really challenging. It's, it's tough to, to uh, figure out how to regroup and to start new habits. Um, but uh, all that said, I think um, maybe we can, we can talk now a little bit more generally about motivation and some frameworks that I've used to think about motivation. And I think that have helped my students and hopefully it'll allow you to self-reflect a little bit and give you a sense of why you might be struggling right now or why you might have 
struggled with motivation in the past. Honestly, it's um, th this topic, like I said, has come up um, several times in the past with, with students with um, our, our motivation comes and goes a little bit. So I think the probably the most common framework that I see for motivation is extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation. Um, extrinsic motivation being behavior driven by external rewards. So that could be winning a top prize in a competition. Um, that could be getting a, an A on your recital or your jury. Um, it might be earning the respect of your peers or the praise of your community. Um, getting a glowing review even in a, in a newspaper after a concert. These are all powerful motivators and they're valid, um, but they depend on the approval of others and the outside world. And um, for the time being, many of those don't, maybe don't exist. Um, and so we have to adjust our mindset a little bit. In contrast, intrinsic motivation will lead to behavior that's driven by internal rewards. So that might include doing things that are just naturally satisfying to you. Um, one thing that I find naturally satisfying is improving competence in some area, whatever that might be, whether it's, um, you know, playing the saxophone or, um, or riding a bike, for instance. Um, some things we do, like I said, because they're therapeutic and they just make us feel good. Um, and I, on the, on the saxophone, it makes us feel good to play. And so for most of us, we're driven by some combination or balance of intrinsic motivators and extrinsic motivators. And now is a good time I think to reflect on this and potentially adjust our outlook a little bit. Are you someone who's more tied to those extrinsic motivators, um, but maybe you have some intrinsic motivators and you just kind of adjust that and focus on those more, for example. Um, for, for students, and again, I know we have a lot of students on here. We have a lot of professionals. We have a lot of teachers. Um, and I wanna to try to address um, as many groups as possible. But for students, you can think about um, how you're motivated by your lessons week to week, for example. So for younger students, um, you might be more extrinsically motivated by your lessons to earn the praise of your teacher. Um, and as you get older, as you mature, um, you might start to transition more towards some of those intrinsic motivators and really just thinking of your lessons or using your lessons to gain knowledge, to continue working towards your own artistic pursuits and not um, the dreams that your teacher might have for you. So um, if you think of um, when a teacher gives you an assignment, are you doing that? Are you completing that assignment because they told you to? Are you doing that or completing the assignment because they want you to? Or you're doing it because you want to and you're kind of on the same page with them. Um, so the, the benefit obviously of taking those assignments and completing them because you want to is you're in charge. And then what happens during a break? What happens in the summer when you're not taking lessons or um, obviously when you graduate? So you can kind of take charge of what you're working on and continue moving in that direction. Um, a, another framework that um, I was just doing a little bit of reading on motivation and one that struck me as sort of interesting was this idea of like, motivated by survival as one step and then the next step being motivated by success and then like the final step being motivated by greatness. I thought that was kind of a, a cool way to think about it. So are you practicing each week just to survive, just to survive another week, make it through another lesson or make it through another performance and all you can see is what's right in front of you um, or that next step success, are you um, motivated by kind of this, this positive idea of I'm going to go into this performance and feel really successful. I'm going to go into this lesson and really nail it. Or like this final step of, of greatness, achieving greatness. Um, and I think um, this, this plays into a little bit of, um, I think later we're going to have a session on uh, performance anxiety. And um, I think this can play into that a little bit um, where your mindset before you go on stage being one of oh, I'm just trying to survive and, and kind of get nervous and you're, you're focused on some of the negatives. Don't mess up. 
um, versus, oh, I'm going in trying to be successful or I'm going in trying to be great. You channel that energy in a really positive way. Um, and then the, the final uh, framework that, this is the one I originally shared with my students and the one that really resonates for me is um, it's also in three levels. And um, I, I think it resonated with me because I, I could really relate to it. Um, so the first level is being motivated by fear, fear-based motivation. The second level is um, motivation based on incentives or rewards. And the third level is motivation based on love. And that's kind of like this ultimate level of motivation. Um, so I'll, I'll go through each one and explain kind of what it means to me. Um, Fear-based motivation can be intrinsic or extrinsic. So it can be, in, you might think about first of all, fear motivation, it sounds like it's probably extrinsic. But if you think about like, a lot of times we put pressure on ourselves and we have a fear of letting ourselves down. And I think that's what a lot of us are dealing with right now is um, we have really high expectations for ourselves and we're, we've kind of been put in the situation where we feel like we're off our game a little bit. Um, we're used to being on this practice routine and hitting it every day and working towards a goal and feeling successful day to day to day. And now we're struggling to figure out what to work on and when to practice, like figure out a, a routine and a schedule that works for us. And so um, I, I think in some ways we, we have this, this feeling of either we're, we're letting ourselves down now or we're afraid that uh, when all this passes, uh, I won't have made the progress I wanted to or, um, or potentially I even lose some of what I had on the horn. Um, and the, the problem with that way of thinking is it's based in negative thought. And um, so I think over time you wanna try to switch that a little bit and, and um, try to turn off those, um, those thought processes of, uh, of fear and, and negativity. Um, thinking of fear-based motivators in how they might be extrinsic um, would be the fear of letting down your teacher maybe, or um, fear of like making mistakes on stage and, and fear of being humiliated in some way. Um, in either case, fear can be a powerful motivator but it's usually not sustainable because I think because it's rooted in negativity, I think we're, we're wired to avoid that mindset and, and try, to, try to avoid it at all costs, which might mean not doing that. Um, I know, um, um, like I said, I think, I think um, that idea of performance anxiety, I think this will be part of that conversation where if you can shift your energy from um, from fear to excitement and channel that energy um, and be excited to go on stage. And so that might lead well into that second level of motivation um, in this framework, which is reward-based or incentive-based, um, which is almost, uh, almost always um, intrinsic, or I'm sorry, extrinsic in, in nature. Um, so it might be earning the praise of your teacher or your idol, maybe you're winning an audition or winning a competition or um, getting some opportunity to, to your career um, that, that kind of drives this motivation. And again, all these are positive and healthy, um, but when those opportunities are stripped away, it becomes hard to find the motivation that you might have previously had. Um, and then, um, well, thinking of that incentive-based or reward-based um, intrinsic motivator, um, like I said earlier, that idea of um, being motivated to increase your competency in, in some area. Um, but, but again, it's hard. You really have, it really has to be intrinsic during these times if you don't have the outlet, if you don't have a recital coming up, um, if you don't have a public place to play. And so that leads into this, this third level of motivation um, based on love. And um, for me, I think this is the ultimate intrinsic motivator and the one that I think very few people ever arrive at. And it's, it's motivation to do something because you inherently love doing it. Um, and it's part of your life and you're gonna keep doing it no matter what, because it's something that you love. Um, and um, 
I think the one person in my mind who has reached that level is, uh, is Professor Sinta. Like thinking about when I was a student, he was up every morning practicing. He was the first person at the music building most days. Um, after he retired, he was at Ravelli Hall playing. And I would guess at, at this point, he's probably in his, morning, in his basement every morning practicing. And it, it's interesting because he doesn't perform in public at all. He refuses to perform in public. He doesn't want people to hear him play. So why? Why does he continue? Why does he continue to get up early every morning and go practice? And um, I sat next to him at a football game in the fall and was just asking him about his playing and um, was curious about what he's working on. He's like, I'm working on my embouchure. I'm, I'm working on, you know, I'm finally getting some consistency with that upper altissimo. Um, and and we, he was telling me about some of the amateur changes that he's made. And um, I just found, found that to be really inspiring that um, he, he, it's such a part of his life that uh, he gets up and does it no matter what. And he's pursuing excellence and um, he's, he's trying to pull everything out of himself and what his potential is. Um, and um, I think part of that is also related to um, like having structure and having discipline and having a routine. And I think that's what's also being disrupted in our own lives right now. I think, I think for Sinta, having that structure is what got him through probably for many, many years during his career where you do it every day, no matter what. Um, and then to the point where it's so ingrained as a habit, that you don't know how to lead your life any other way and you, and you keep doing it. Um, so um, what I've been thinking about myself is what do I love about playing the saxophone? And I think it's different for all of us. Um, and that's what I've been focusing on recently. Um, for me, I just like the feeling of playing the instrument. I think that's something that I was sure to, um, from from the beginning. Is um, sorry, was somebody purposely trying to say something, or is the mic just on? I think the mic was accidentally on. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, so for me, like I said, when I started playing, just the feeling of the instrument resonating and vibrating in my hands and vibrating in your mouth in my mouth. Um, was something that I, I always gravitated towards and liked. And um, for me, when I picked up saxophone, it was between percussion and saxophone. And I really wanted to be a drummer. And um, my older brother played saxophone and he let me play on his student model horn. And I, and I, you know, I remember the first time playing it, just trying to play a sound and that sensation that it kind of shocks you at first, the instrument vibrating in your mouth. And but once I got the hang of it, I was like, wow, this is really cool. It felt really powerful to just play the horn. And so I'm finding recently my practice sessions are honestly like I just, I'm breaking in reads right now and I'm revisiting the voicing book. So the other day I played and I played, I mean, I played straight through the voicing book pretty much um, with, with breaks. Like he says, um, you know, you shouldn't go more than about 20 minutes in a session on those exercises because you can um, potentially um, hurt yourself. But um, I'm finding breaking in reads, you know what? Um, I can break in reads now and play on them months, months and months later. And um, I was telling some of my students um, just about um, some of the reads that I've been performing on recently. And, and you might be surprised to know that they're, they're quite old. Um, the um, read, for instance, I, that I played uh, the concerto on at NASA was one that I broke in. Um, in September, I think it was Labor Day weekend is when I cracked that box open. So if you think about, that was six months ago or so. So I can be breaking in reads now that I use, perform in September or October. So it feels like a good use of time, but it's also getting me playing the instrument and that feels good. Um, and then these voicing exercises, it's been a while since I've really just like kind of dug into this book, but it, they, they're really rewarding and satisfying in, in a funny way. And um, so we'll get to that in, in a bit um, and actually work through some of those exercises. But I'm finding that that has been really rewarding. I'm finding that I, I'm, I'm finding what I love about playing the instrument. I think for, for a lot of people, what you love about playing the saxophone is the music itself. 
And so figure out what that music is, figure out the music that speaks to you. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the music that was assigned to you or that, you know, is, is on an upcoming concert that you didn't program, but, but what is it that you love? Um, and I have a couple students right now working on unaccompanied Bach just because they love it. They're not planning to perform it for any reason, but it's something that they can read through and um, it feels like uh, that music speaks to them. And um, that was something I used to go to in the summer. So I would get to the end of the semester and you have a couple of weeks off and uh, maybe after a recital or after a jury and I wanted to keep playing, but I didn't have any performances coming up. I didn't really feel like working on scales at that point. So I, my go-to was the Caravan book. I'd pull out those Bach transcriptions and just read through them. And I'm actually finding myself doing that recently as well. Um, I, I was um, reading through some of the Bach transcriptions the other day. Um, I think for, for some of us, um, and if you fall in this category, I'm guessing this is hitting you the hardest. Um, for some of us, the thing that we love about making music is the people that we play with. Um, I know I have friends who it doesn't even matter what type of music they're playing. What's more important to them is who they're playing it with. Um, and I can totally relate to, to you. I can totally re relate to if you're feeling that way. I miss playing in my quartet right now. Um, of course, we had that the series of premieres lined up from about M March through June. And to be honest, right now, it's not so much about missing the music. Of course, I, I miss working. Well, again, it's about the people. I, I, I miss putting the projects together with, with the people. Um, and for us, I think those concerts will get rescheduled and the music will get premiered and we'll move on. But that's going to be months from now. And I, it's going to be months until I can make music again with the guys in the quartet. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things, you know, that is, is I'm finding challenging. Um, and we talk to each other and we see each other on zoom or whatever it might be. We have, we have meetings and, um, but that doesn't replace the experience of making music together. Um, and, and so, you know, my, my recommendation at this point is you can think about what it is that you really love about playing saxophone. Is it the love of just playing the instrument? Um, then just play. Um, is it the music? Then, then find the music that you love and play it. Um, if it's the people, then reach out to those folks. And, you know, if you can do this, um, FaceTime, um, we've been trying to do that as much as we can, maybe every couple of nights, reach out to different friends and um, and FaceTime with them and stay in touch with them. And like I said, it doesn't replace making music with, with that person, but at least you feel connected in some way. And, um, you know, hopefully um, those people are, are people that build you up. Um, connect with, with students, connect with former students, connect with former teachers. I think all of those things are going to be just that little bit of uh, whatever you want to call it, the thing that, that gets you over that hump and um, motivates you to, to play that day. Um, and again, I don't want to assume that we're all in the, the same boat. I, like I said, I think some of us are maybe struggling more, more than others. Um, if you feel like you're cru cruising along really well, then, um, you know, there, you can, you can either talk to your, your teacher or, or self-reflect and think about, well, what are some new skill sets I want to work on? It's always rewarding to, work on self-improvement or to improve yourself in some some way to improve like i said your competence in some area um if you're a student maybe now it's it's a time for you to finally learn how to slap tongue or develop your circular breathing or or your double tonguing um above all i think find something that will get you on the horn and playing again um i think you will find that it's therapeutic and um i think you know, give it a couple of weeks. And um, I, I think, you know, for, for some people, I think right now um, we're kind of in survival mode, crisis mode almost. And, and that needs to take precedent. Of course, you need to, to take care of your own health, um, the health of the people you're close to, your loved ones. Um, but you also have to think about your mental health. And I think you have to think about 
the mental health of, of your loved ones. Um, I was reading an article in the last couple of days um, that was talking about, you know, just the mental health side effects of, of what we're going through now, but like how it's going to linger for years and years and years. And so I, I think if you can, if you can play or whatever it is you love about it, that's going to be therapeutic. That's going to help you connect with people and that, that's going to help you too. And, and so um, I, I wish you all the best of luck, um, kind of finding your own way um, through all of this. And um, if, if you're in a, I mean, it's like I said, it's different for all of us, like here in Kansas city, um, you know, I was able to, to go out on a run this morning, no problem. But you know, if you're in, if you're in New York city, for example, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck indoors. I, I think um, depending on where you're at, this is um, having a different impact. Uh, but if you are in a place where you can get outside, absolutely do it. It's, I finding it, it's just really, really uplifting. Walk your dog, go for a run, um, plant a garden. Um, or if you're up North, I saw you got a bunch of snow recently, go out and shovel or, um, you know, go out and shovel for a neighbor. Um, that's uh, getting you outside, getting you some, some kind of physical exercise that's going to make you feel good, connecting with other people, all of those things um, I think are, are going to help lift your spirits and, um, and um, kind, of, kind of get through this. So um, before I go on to um, kind of the second half of what I wanted to talk about with um, voicing exercises, I wanted to just recommend that we um, start a couple feeds uh, or a couple threads over in Facebook. I think would be the best place to do it. Um, and so um, maybe Nathan, I can ask you to, to start these um, or if you wanna chime in with some suggestions in the chat, um, like a starting point, a question would be, what are some of the main challenges that you've faced recently? And then hopefully we can use this community as kind of a support network. Um, like I said, I think we're all facing different challenges and, and some challenges that we can't even really put a finger on it. Like, why do I feel this way? Um, so what are the challenges that you've faced? And then if, if anyone can kind of chime in with some, some support, that could be helpful. Or maybe what are some things that have helped you recently find motivation to practice? Um, are, are there some suggestions um, that you can offer for all of us? So those would be kind of the, the two questions that I would ask. And, if you have other questions that might interest you, um, feel free to suggest them in the chat. But, um, but those would be the two starting points, I think, that where we can all help each other is um, identify maybe some of the challenges that you faced and then identify some of the things that have helped you recently. So um, I'm going to take a second and um, just soak a read and um, get my horn set up. Um, and if you'd like to, feel free to um, make some comments in, in the chat or, or go over on Facebook. Um, it'll just take me about a minute to get it set up. Also, um, I should mention that um, I'll be referencing some exercises in Don Sinta's voicing book. So if you have that book, um, it might be worth pulling it out. Um, and the specific pages um, that I'll be referencing are um, pages 36, through 41. Um, and um, Dr. Knapp shared those, I think, through uh, a Google link. Um, yeah, I uploaded the link to the, um, to the discussion post in your event page. So for those of you who didn't see that, it is in the, um, in the comments under uh, uh, Professor Schumann's link. So take a second to maybe um, download that or take a look at it so that you can um, reference it if you'd like to. I'm also going to adjust my levels. So um, Nate, if you can just let me know if it's, if it's cool or if I need to adjust it one way or another. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Okay. So I'll just to, I'll just to kind of as I go in and out of, of talking and playing. So for the second half of the, half of the class, I wanted to talk about how I've been revisiting some of these exercises from the voicing book to work on um, sound and projection issues, my own playing, um, but, but also how um, I've been working on this with some of my students. So start by talking about projection specifically. Um, this came up after I played with the, the band at ASU at the NASA conference, and I had a couple of folks ask me how, um, how I work on projection. Um, and uh, specifically in the context of playing a concerto with a wind band like that. Um, and just to kind of give you a background on my own playing, um, I would say the majority of the playing that I do, the majority of the performing that I do is in a, in a chamber music setting. I'm playing alto saxophone in the prison quartet, or um, you know, I'm often asked to play in the Kansas City Symphony in a woodwind section. Um, and so I find that playing a concerto with a band or an orchestra is a very different way of playing. Um, in many ways, my setup, uh, the decisions that I've made about the reeds that I play and the ligature and the mouthpiece and every aspect of my horn has been informed by the playing that I spend a lot of time doing. And um, playing in a concerto context is not something that I do regularly. I might do it once or twice a year. So I have to, I find that I have to adjust my way of playing a little bit in those contexts. And um, I think that's where um, some of these exercises hopefully will be helpful. Um, regarding projection, typically, I think in, in master classes, I'll see this approach from the standpoint of air, expanding lung capacity, increasing the volume of air that we're able to push from our lungs. And um, I, I think there are plenty of resources for working on those things. In fact, that could be a discussion that we have on this forum. Um, at another time, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm not going to focus on projection from the standpoint of air so much, but more from the standpoint of how you have your oral cavity set. Um, and it, it, again, um, with any of these things, you know, feel free to start another thread on, you know, what are some good um, exercises or resources for developing your, um, your, your lung capacity, your air support. Um, but what, what I want to focus on today is how you build the, the musculature to channel all that air through the instrument. Um, so to start, I'll use an analogy of a, a fire hose. And again, that's, that's something that I often see coming up. Fire hose, when we talk about air um, and uh, pushing air through the horn. Imagine you attach a fire hose to a fire hydrant and a fire hydrant has plenty of water pressure. Water pressure but the, the person holding to the end, holding on to the end of the hose has to have enough strength to hold on to it, right? Otherwise, the hose is going to go wild, right, and spray everywhere. So um, if you think about that, if you extend that analogy to playing a wind instrument, um, assuming we have the lung capacity and the, the muscular, musculature developed in the lungs to push that much air, then the end of that hose is really like in our oral cavity. Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate some of these exercises at a really, really high volume. Um, and um, I'll adjust the level. So hopefully, I mean, I know with, with these things, the sound quality, you're not really going to hear what it might sound like in the room. But just you'll probably be able to see in my face when I'm playing full on. Um, so I first want to just demonstrate, if I play quickly, with what I would call like an unfocused airstream versus a more focused airstream. So start with unfocused. So there's some distortion in the sound, at least in, in, in my live, in my space. Um, it, so the distortion you're hearing um, whether it's the microphone or the speakers or anything else, there's distortion in the sound. Let me play with the, I'll try to play with the same uh, volume of air, but with a more focused airstream. So let me do one more back and forth of what I just did. 
I'm focused. Exactly. Yeah. You may want to turn it down just a little bit. I think you're 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 peeking out the mic. Here. Sure. Mic's too close. Let's try this. So I'll go um, unfocused and then focused. Here's the unfocused. And now here's the hopefully the focused one. So um, again, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, hopefully that's coming through in your speakers. Hopefully you can hear a difference or maybe see a difference in the way that I'm approaching the instrument. Um, so the question is, how do we develop the musculature necessary to focus the airstream in the way so that when you push more air, your oral cavity is, is locked in and able to kind of channel that air through the instrument. So. Um, for me, what I found is revisiting some of these exercises from Simpson's voicing book has really given me that stability so that when I push a ton of air through the horn, it's contained. Um, so again, I'm going to be referencing exercises um, from pages 36 through 40 in the, um, in the voicing book. Um, and um, I, some of these exercises, I, I, don't, I don't actually follow them exactly the way that Professor Sinta has them outlined. Um, and that's certainly worth doing. I think it's worth working through this book um, exactly the way he prescribes it. But I, I just have some sort of variations that I do on these exercises that I'll demonstrate. Um, and I actually want to credit um, one of my students who, um, who brought these into his lesson, I think it was this semester, uh, my student Caleb, um, came in and it's something that he's been focusing on for years and his playing is developing uh, projection and um, and he he brought these into lessons. I've been working on these voicing exercises. What do you think? Um, and we worked through them and um, just in the matter of like five or 10 minutes, uh, we really felt like his sound was, was like bigger and more resonant and contained. Um, and so after that lesson, I was like, man, I need to, I need to be doing these. And I'm finding when I'm doing them regularly, it's, it's like doing some kind of like stretch routine um, in the morning. Like if you, if you ever do yoga, you walk around the rest of the day and you just feel kind of limber and, and uh, like a weight has been lifted. Um, that's how I'm finding these exercises to be when I work on them, then the playing the rest of the day just kind of locked everything in. So um, let's take a look at page 36. So this is in the section um, titled third, the third mode from chapter five of the voicing book. And I'm gonna to go to exercise seven. And like I said, I'm not gonna play this exactly as written, but um, these are essentially um, alternating, what I'm gonna be playing is alternating between the fundamental and, I'm sorry, uh, I'm gonna be alternating between the second overtone and the actual note. So for example, if you think about low B flat on the alto, um, the second overtone will be um, an octave F. And I'm gonna alternate between playing that pitch, that A flat concert from the written pit or from the written fingering of F and then alternating to getting the overtone off of low B flat. So for example. And then I'll work my way up in half steps. So that last one was uh, octave B flat and then an overtone off of low B flat. And then in, in exercise seven, then you go from octave B flat to low B flat. So you're going from a second overtone to a third overtone, um, hence the third mode. And you heard my first attempt didn't come out um, when I went to, to play that third overtone back to the fundamental fingering. It didn't come out. And for me, that's, that's kind of what I'm working on is if I can keep that pitch, if I can kind of lock things in in my oral cavity and maintain that pitch, I'm finding that that's, that's going to be a really good position to play that note when I push more air. So again, if I go back to that, I'm going to play the third overtone B flat. I'm sorry, I'm going to play the written 
um, the written fingering octave B flat, then play it as a third overtone. And I'm, I'm going to purposely not get it first, and then I'm gonna lock in and then get it. So you hear the difference. <laughs> And now I'm going to just play that note, imagining I'm playing it as an overtone, but with the written fingering. And so what I'm finding is at that top volume, that's a, a really good oral cavity position for me to be in. Um, now, for me, that doesn't apply so much if I play um, softly. It's a, it's a different oral cavity position when I'm playing softly, but this is, um, for me, a really good position when I'm playing at those, those really high-end volumes, um, the volumes that you might play with if you're playing a, um, a piece where you have to get over piano, I'm thinking about you know, the Denisov Sonata, for example, or if you're playing a piece with orchestra or band and you have to be able to project over those, those large ensembles. So then these exercises progress. So exercise nine, I'll go through it very quickly. done with the exercise what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll play um, just the not non overtone versions of each of these but at the loudest possible volume I can play so hopefully you can tell that I'm I'm playing kind of beyond where I would ever even play like it'd be like if I was playing 3S, fortissimo, um, and you can hear the sound might be a little distorted or the, um, the, the pitch might be a little bit distorted, um, but I compare it to like if you're lifting weights, you have to lift heavier weights to get stronger. Um, you have to find your limit and go beyond your limits a little bit to readjust your limits up and up. Um, I'm going to move on. Exercise 10 is kind of the same thing, um, but a step higher. Exercise 11 is kind of the same thing up another half step higher. So I'm going to move on now to the fourth mode um, to exercise 12. And again, um, I'm not I'm not working on the exercises I just went through. This is not how Professor Sinta outlines working on them. Um, this is just a way that I've adapted the exercises. And so similarly, I'm going to do the same thing, um, page 37 on the fourth mode. trick for this one, you might have heard that second to last one didn't come out for me. So I, I played a palm D and then I tried to play an overtone off of low D and it kind of got squirrely on me. Um, and the reason is that um, I just played the normal low D fingering. Um, and one of the suggestions that Professor Sinta makes in the book is for some of these overtones, you have to, you have to vent. So like on a low D and up, you want to keep venting your C sharp. So I'm going to play Palm D, and then play that same pitch as an overtone of low D with the normal fingering, and you'll hear it get a little squirrely, and then I'll do it with low C sharp so you can hear the difference. So you hopefully you heard the second one came out much cleaner and more in tune. Um, and, and the same thing will apply as we go higher. Um, if you, once you get to above E flat, like if you keep that E flat vented, sometimes that can help. So if you're finding some of the overtones don't really want to speak so well, um, that's something that you can, you can do that might help you. So now we're into fourth overtones, um, D and then overblowing um, low B flat up to that fourth overtone D. And now that I've done that, I'm going to go back and play the written pitches, not as overtones, but at that really extreme dynamic and thinking about locking my oral cavity 
in in the same way that I had to lock it in um, to play that pitch as an overtone off of low D and low B flat. So I'm going to start by, by doing the last two, um, the third overtone of low D and the fourth overtone of low B flat, and then I'll go back and play it um, with the normal fingerings. So again, that's like top volume. And then if I keep going, um, exercise 13 is um, the same exercise of a half step, 14, 15, same progression. Um, so you can work through those on your own. Um, I'm gonna skip over now to page 39, summary review. For me, um, I, I find that um, it's really the, the bottom exercise on this page on 39, starting on D is where it's most applicable applicable for me. Um, some of the below the break first overtones, I find that it's actually not the oral cavity position I want to be in for playing really big. So I'm going to play um, on page 39, the bottom exercise. Um, it's exercise 16, um, the fifth one. It starts on, on D. And I'm going to play it three times. I'm going to play first with just normal fingerings, D, E, F sharp, G, A, at kind of a comfortable volume, like mezzo piano or mezzo forte. Then I'm going to play those same pitches as overtones on the notes that he has written, um, low D, E, low B, low C, low D. Um, and, then I'm going to go, and then I'm going to go back and play them with the normal fingerings at that top volume. And that's just to get those pitches in my ear. same thing but I'll go up and back. So I'm going to go to the overtones. And then back to the written finger or the normal fingering. And now I'll do the same thing uh, if I turn the page. Um, exercise 16 continued, the first exercise on um, page 40. second exercise. So let me stop there and um, just demonstrate if I do those overtones but I don't lock in what might happen, what, what sounds might come out on that exercise. So playing them as overtones really forces me to find the appropriate voicing position um, for that note to speak clearly. And um, I think this is where you'll find these to be these exercises to be useful for a lot of different contexts outside of just we think of the voicing book as well. It's an approach to the third register. It's an approach to playing altissimo. Well, it's also an approach to playing with great projection in the non-altissimo register. And, and for me, I'm finding these exercises to be really useful um, from that register of um, about middle D up to like palm keys, D, D sharp, E, um, F, and F sharp. So um, I won't go through all of them. Hopefully that was enough demonstration for you to kind of get the gist of them. Um, 
but go ahead and, and try these exercises out. And um, like I said, I think this is a great time to revisit resources like this book and find new applications for them. Um, and, you know, just thinking about how we're practicing right now in general, I referenced earlier, you have to adjust how you're thinking of your practice plans these days. So if you had a recital booked in May and it's postponed to September, well, that changes the way that you want to be thinking about your practicing at this point. And this is something that I work on with my students is developing a practice plan that's periodized over the course of the year. So we're not always practicing in the same ways. And this is something that I've a, a method or a, a way of thinking of your practicing that I've borrowed from like triathlon training where um, you build a base early in the season and then you kind of work on the en energy systems associated with race pace. And then as you get closer to a race, you actually work on d exercising um, each of those, uh, your workouts being more like race specific paces and your workouts end up being more like a race. Likewise, I think if you're, recital now has been postponed to September or sometime next year, now is a really good time to revisit exercises like this or like your just whatever your other fundamentals are that you're working on, whether it's technique or um, however you work on tone. And, um, and then look at the repertoire that you aspire to play in the fall or next spring or in two years and ask yourself, what, what are the skills that I'm lacking at this point to be able to approach that repertoire? And now's a really good time to work on those and to, to try to build those skills up. Um, Nate, can you see, are there any questions that you see in the in the chat um, that, that I might be able to answer um, quickly? Yeah, or? there were a couple um, that, that were back from when you were talking about uh, motivation. And the first one um, is from Christopher Scott, I think it's a great question. It's, do you find motivation through preset short and long-term goals? And if you do, could you give examples of short and long-term goals that a senior music performance major can have during these difficult times? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a little bit what I was talking about right now, uh, um, short and long-term goals. So um, I do, I mean, I do definitely find motivation from both short and long-term goals. Um, oftentimes for me at this stage, they're related to um, performances that I've coming up in the short term and in the long term. But thinking about when I was a student, um, some of my long term goals would be, you know, this is a piece that I aspire to play when I'm a senior in college, or this is a piece I aspire to play in two years, or this is a piece that I want to play in a competition that's 11 months from now. And I actually need that much time to learn that, that piece at that level. You know, I'm thinking about like when I was learning, um, pieces by Christian Loba, those aren't pieces that you learn in a month. Um, or when I learned the Berio sequenza, you know, the, those are pieces that I would want a period of time like this to just like shed for weeks and sometimes months before I even went into a lesson. I remember going into a lesson one time with one line of the Berio sequenza for my lesson <laughs> because it took me a week to learn a line and um, that's not a very rewarding lesson. So, uh, but for me, having those goals that, uh, whether it's a piece that you aspire to play someday, um, that's oftentimes can be a great long-term goal or, um, you know, a competition that you want to do in a year or in a couple of years. Um, and then with short-term goals, you could think of it a couple ways. One way you can think of it is, um, you know, if your competition is in a year, what are the steps that you take to get there and trying to learn how to plan with your teacher that gets you to where you want to be. So uh, for my students, it, it's at the beginning of each school year, we have a student class where we just talk about, we lay out all the fundamentals that you could be working on. Like this is every technical exercise you can think of from scales to intervals to arpeggios and, um, and anything else. We talk about all the voicing exercises you could work on or all the ways you could work on intonation or all the ways that you could develop your articulation speed um, or how you could work on vibrato or extended techniques, how you can develop your extended techniques. And a lot of our lessons in the fall are focused on those things, just focused on building those skills. Um, and oftentimes I find my students are really good about like bringing etudes in <laughs> early in the school year. And then by the end of the semester, uh, <laughs> not as much, but um, it's because they're focusing on more 
race specific things, if you will, or um, they're, they're focusing on their jury pieces or on their recital pieces as they get closer to those. So um, have a short term goal at this point that's maybe uh, might be helpful for that to be a quantifiable goal. Like I want to get my whatever exercises to whatever tempo in whatever key. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. Uh, yeah, J James Bunty asked um, about the article or book you were um, quoting earlier about survival versus greatness. He was wanting to know the name of that. I don't remember where that came from. I think I was just um, just searching online and found something um, and found that to be um, just a, a nice framework. Um, but yeah, kind of this progression from um, yeah, survival to greatness. Sorry, I don't have a <laughs> better uh, source for that. Yeah, and Alex Dietz asked, um, how would you suggest introducing voicing to high school students? Um, you know, that's, that could be its own <laughs> uh, class, honestly. Um, I could do a very brief version of how I introduce it to high school students and younger students. Um, but, you know, this is something that we could go very much in depth on. Um, for me, I like to actually um, work on the mouthpiece by itself. Um, and just have the student play on the mouthpiece. And, um, and then we do a series of exercises where we're just experimenting. Um, so I have them, um, in fact, you can work through the voicing book and um, Professor Sinta has some um, examples of experimenting. So he has students whistling different pitches or um, saying different syllables, um, like thinking of vowel syllables like a, a, e, o, u, and how that changes your oral cavity position and your tongue position. Um, but the one that I focus on for teaching students to voice is, uh, is E, um, that particular uh, syllable, that vowel, E. And then I go from E to he, almost like you're hissing. So I have a higher tongue position. And if you feel your tongue touching your molars, um, and it's, it's kind of channeling the air um, the same way I was just describing when I was working through some of these exercises, it's um, channeling the, the air and, and containing it. Um, and then from there, I'll have them try to play on the mouthpiece with that he shape or, or position. And then I'll add a K articulation to it, like um, to try to get the student to really feel what their tongue is doing inside of their mouth. Um, it, for me, it's really helpful to say, uh, he or E and feel the tongue touching the molars. That's a really nice reference point. And then adding the K syllable, I can feel my tongue kind of moving in my mouth and closing off in the back of my throat. Um, and that gives me some reference points. Otherwise our tongue is just kind of floating in the mouth and we're not really aware of where it is. So I'll do that kind of thing. Um, and I can demonstrate real quick what that might sound like on the mouthpiece. If I do um, like and on the mouthpiece. And what I'm listening for is little dips in the sound or cracks in the sound. And I call those like voicing sounds. Sorry, neighbors. Um, or <laughs> if you have if you have pets, they hate that. But um, that, those are the kind of exercises we do early on, is just experimenting with tongue position and um, trying to get um, voicing sounds, whatever those might be, cracks in the, in the sound or some scoops and some bending in the sound. Um, and then I might apply that on the horn and do the same thing on um, like a palm D, I like that as a spot, um, all the way up to like front F and doing the F trick that Professor Sinta talks about. Um, and that for me is like, if a student can do the F trick, then they're kind of in business and it's you're kind of over that, that hurdle. So the hardest thing with working with young students is getting them to the F trick. And I think that's what you're asking. So um, for me, it's experimenting with some of those uh, vowel positions with the tongue and adding that K syllable in and trying to get some cracks and bends in the sound. So if I do that on palm D, You get those kind of sounds. So it's like if you're um, if you're trying to double tongue sometimes in that register in the palm keys and you accidentally get 
um, a scoop or a, a crack in the sound. It's like trying to intentionally get that and then slow down that motion so that you're able to stop the tongue short of the K syllable. Um, and it's almost like the tongue is like approaching the roof of the mouth, but you stop short. Um, hey, um, can you do these exercises at, at soft and uh, loud dynamics? Are they functional at both? They are, yeah, yeah. So let me do it at a soft dynamic. So that was on, on Palm D at a soft dynamic. And yeah. I'm just trying to stop short of like totally closing off the airstream with a, with a K syllable that you might think of with like a double tongue. Cool. And I have one more question that just came in and this was, um, as primarily a Barry player, I find myself struggling to achieve the same clarity of tone and comfort on alto as I do on Barry. Other than the exercises you went over today, do you have any other tips or exercises to transition from another instrument? Um, from another instrument in the family? Yeah. Um, that, that can be challenging. I think, um, I think one thing to think about is if you're primarily a, a baritone player or a tenor player or whatever, um, is um, think about how long it took you to develop your um, current aptitude on that instrument. And you have to plan on spending that much time and energy on the other instrument. Um, so um, don't just try to be patient with the process of um, working through some of the same things you worked on on baritone, um, working on those things on alto. So we all um, know about like the, the 10,000 hours, right? The Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and I used to be really frustrated with my soprano playing. I'm like, why is my soprano playing not as good as my alto playing? Um, and it's because I hadn't played on, it, on that instrument as much. And there was a certain point that I remember suddenly my soprano playing feeling much more comfortable where I could just go back and forth between alto and soprano. And it was, you know, probably when I was reaching a little bit closer to the, those 10,000 hours. So patient number one, but then um, also I think you just have to be really mindful of the differences between the instruments. So um, if you play an alto and it feels like you're playing baritone, um, that really isn't, isn't correct. Um, so what I'd recommend that you do is talk to like a baritone specialist. I mean, I saw uh, Stephen Banks was on here. I don't know if he's, he's still on, but shoot him a message or, um, you know, uh, Tamer Sullivan, like, um, you know, people who are constantly switching back and forth um, between baritone and, and alto. Um, what I find the big differences for me are um, on Baritone, it feels like I have a lot more mouthpiece in my mouth. And alto, it feels like I have a lot less mouthpiece in my mouth. Uh, proportionally, it, it should be similar. It should be a similar amount of mouthpiece, but it's going to feel like you don't have as much mouthpiece in your mouth on alto. Um, and then for me on baritone, it feels like a really open, oh, like, like much more open um, throat position, uh, lower tongue position um, versus on alto, where it's a little bit, um, the tongue is a little bit higher and a little bit more forward. And, and for me, progressing from baritone, more open to tenor, to alto, to soprano, soprano being much more forward. Um, so closer to that E position or even up there versus baritone, which is more O, O, O. I feel like it's a little more open, um, but I'm certainly not a baritone um, specialist. Um, so I would, I would try to talk to someone who's regularly making that switch between um, baritone and alto. Um, but I think all of these exercises are valuable. And I think one point that I want to make um, and maybe even leave, leave you with today to wrap up is all of the applications for the, these voicing exercises. And I don't know that really any of them are direct applications unless you're playing a piece that specifically calls for overtones. Um, maybe if you're playing uh, the Zanakis Quartet and at the end it has um, harmonics written in uh, specifically. Um, but the, uh, what I found some of the applications um, that I wouldn't even have thought of for, for voicing, um, when I started working on voicing, I was like, I want to play in the altissimo. Um, and that's why I'm doing it. Um, but like I said, now I'm finding, well, they're actually really applicable to playing loud um, and developing projection. Um, some things that you might not think of is I found that voicing exercises actually help me with single tongue speed. And the reason is, what I find is if I'm really voicing in the center of every note, um, like I was demonstrating earlier, I find that response is a little bit quicker. 
and if response is quicker, then that, you know, even my, if my tongue is able to keep up, but response is lagging, then I'm not able to achieve the single tongue speed that I was, that I was going for. So I find that voicing exercises can help with um, both response as well as single tongue speed. Um, another thing that I found that it's really useful for is vibrato actually. Um, so I find that working on voicing exercises, especially mouthpiece exercises and front F trick and um, just pitch bending in general, um, those things have been really helpful for developing flexibility and that flexibility has led to a more kind of round um, shape to my vibrato and allows me to achieve more of like a vocal vibrato, I would say. Um, certainly um, it can help with um, controlling multiphonics um, and then also just with developing sound. Um, and this was something I remember when I was a high school student, um, I went to a studio recital. I, I grew up um, in Michigan um, near Ann Arbor. And I remember going to a, a studio recital and hearing the college students play. And um, I asked my student or my, my teacher, why do they all sound different than me? <laughs> Um, and he was like, oh, well, they, you know, they all, they all are, have, have mastered these voicing exercises and their, their, um, their sounds have matured and, um, and it really didn't make any sense to me. But I think as I developed more of a control over these exercises, I realized, oh, they're, they're able to actually choose how they want to sound. They're able to manipulate their sound because they have so much flexibility. So I think that's one of the keys is um, the more flexibility you can develop, um, it gives you more options so that you can really make the choice um, and you're not just playing the way that all well, that mouthpiece sounds a certain way or that read sounds a certain way, but you're, you're making the decision on um, how you're going to make your equipment sound. Um, are there any other, uh, other questions before we wrap up? Uh, I, I think that was it, but um, man, I really, really enjoyed uh, everything you had to say, I mean, both topics and it's really very informative and I, you know, just got a lot of uh, good comments about how much it resonates with them. And so, um, yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for setting this up and I'm really looking forward to, like I said, all the amazing presenters coming up. Um, it's really a, a treat and um, it, it's something really great that I think that, that has come out of all of this. So, um, well, thank you all for tuning in and everyone stay safe, be well, and uh, feel free to send me a message. Um, you can email me or send me a private message on, on Facebook and follow up on any of this stuff. Um, the more, like I said, the more we can connect with each other, the better. And um, if there's ever a time that I have, um, or that I have the time to, to um, you know, just to, to interact and respond and engage, it's now. So, um, feel free to send me a note and I look forward to connecting. Thanks, Zach. And we'll get that discussion going uh, that you asked about on, on the Facebook page. So thank you so much and uh, take care. All right. Take care. Thanks.